So today's video is going to focus on cellular respiration, really just kind of an overview of respiration, some of the chemistry behind how these reactions work, a little bit of a talk about ATP, and then we'll go through glycolysis. And in your next video, we'll keep going with aerobic respiration, continue on with Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So let's first uh, start with uh, this molecule right here. Okay, so what we have right here, hopefully you've realized, is ATP, okay, adenosine tri phosphate. Okay, so ATP is made up of an adenine molecule, a, a sugar, in particular ribose, a, as well as three phosphate groups attached to it. Okay, so structurally it is uh, similar to a nucleic acid. Uh, this is a adenine, is the nitrogen base that you find in both DNA and RNA. A, it has the same sugar as RNA, that pentose sugar ribose. And, if, <coughs> excuse me, but if y'all remember, your nucleic acids, uh, your nucleotides that build your nucleic acids only have one phosphate group. They consist of the nitrogen base, the sugar, and the one phosphate group. ATP has two more added on the end there. So ATP is our, um, what we like to think of as our usable energy. It's our chemical energy that can easily be utilized. Okay. It will release energy when a phosphate is removed. So when we remove one of these phosphate molecules, okay, energy is released. So respiration actually fuels the uh, formation of ATP. Okay. Remember, ATP is relatively unstable. Okay. Um, it can only be used for short-term energy storage. So most organisms have molecules of ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate. So it only has two phosphates attached to it. And so when we add a phosphate, an inorganic phosphate to those, you get a TP, you get your triphosphate. And so ATP is uh, relatively unstable, so it's only used for short-term energy. Okay? It is, its energy is stored in its electron configuration, or how the electrons are arranged. Okay, and throughout the video, just so you guys know, okay, if you see me write that, that is an electron. Okay, if you see me write a capital E, that is energy. Okay, we're going to kind of shorthand some stuff here. Okay, so lowercase e with the um, negative exponent there is an electron. Capital E is energy. Okay, so ATP stores energy based on its electron configuration or arrangement. These three phosphate groups, they have four negative charges. Okay, and those four negative charges are in a relatively small area. And hopefully you guys remember negative versus negative repel each other. And so that results in all these negative uh, charges being here in this small area, that repulsion okay, causes them to have a very high potential energy. Okay, very high potential energy in those bonds. Okay, and it also, that repulsion there weakens the bonds between the phosphate groups. Okay, that's part of why they're unstable. They're considered high energy bonds. Okay, so this is readily, this third phosphate here is readily broken off. And you'll notice when you break that third phosphate and you, um, this molecule goes back to being a DP, which is this portion here, Okay, you've lost two of those negative charges. So it's significantly more stable than ATP. So ATP um, powers a variety of um, reactions. Okay, it can do transport work, like it's showing you here. ATP can help <coughs> power the transport, the membrane protein. Okay, the ATP phosphorylates or adds one of its phosphates to the membrane protein, okay, which is, allows it to function. ATP can power uh, mechanical work where with our motor proteins. Okay? And so those motor proteins, when they're phosphorylated, it allows them to do work. ATP also powers chemical work. Okay? It can phosphorylate the reactants and basically power the chemical reaction. So ATP is formed during cellular respiration. And that's the point of cellular respiration. So cells need all these different 
reactions to happen. They need transportation to happen, mechanical work to happen, chemical work to happen, and most of that is going to be powered by ATP. Remember, ATP is produced again by cellular respiration, and we're going to be focused at first on aerobic respiration when oxygen is present. So let's look at this diagram a little bit then and kind of talk about our energy flow for just a minute, cycling through. Okay, so hopefully you guys realize pretty quickly we've got a chloroplast up here, we've got a mitochondria down here. Okay, so the kind of energy that's coming into the chloroplast, well, that's our light energy. That light energy gets converted into our chemical energy or our um, glucose, our organic compounds. Okay, so that light energy is converted into organic compounds, which remember these are a form of chemical energy. Okay, and then that chemical energy will enter into the mitochondria, releasing ATP, which is a form of usable energy, right? And that, um, that mitochondria, as it's breaking down that organic compound into uh, that usable ATP, it is going to end up releasing CO2. Okay. Same with the uh, chloroplast releasing the oxygen. The oxygen is required for cellular respiration. Okay. And so we cycle through both the gases. Okay. So we cycle through the carbon going into the chloroplast. A, and the mitochondria releasing the carbon. We cycle the, or, the oxygen that's released from the chloroplast taken into the mitochondria, as well as the organic um, compound utilizing the organic compound that comes from photosynthesis into that usable ATP. So to fully understand this energy transfer, we're going to need to talk about what are called redox reactions. And redox reactions are oxidation, reduction reactions. And so sophomores, this is where um, you may have a little bit of trouble. You may need to come in for a little bit of extra tutoring. Uh, from what I understand, you have not covered this yet in chemistry. Um, juniors and seniors, you should have covered this in chemistry. But for everybody, we're just going to kind of start from ground zero. Okay, so we're going to spend a little bit of time here talking about oxidation, uh, redox reactions, oxidation and reduction, to make sure that everybody's on the same page with our same knowledge base. Okay, so redox reactions, or those oxidation reduction reactions, these redox reactions are used to transfer electrons between reactants. Okay, so I am transferring those electrons between the various reactants of my chemical reaction. Remember, our reactants are what are going into the chemical reaction. And what will happen is we will have um, one molecule will be oxidized and one will be reduced. So some, some molecules will be oxidized and some will be reduced. And the way we'll remember what causes what is our acronym OIL rig. Okay. So if we say that something is going through oxidation or has been oxidized, okay, so oxidation is, it's the I, let me write it all out, okay, oxidation is losing an electron. And so that's your OIL, okay, oxidation is losing an electron. And when this happens, okay, the oxidation number is going to increase. Okay, so when the, when the atom loses the electron, the oxidation number will increase. And we'll talk about what oxidation numbers are in just a second. Okay, the second part here, the rig part, we've got reduction is, so there's our RI gaining an electron. So with reduction, the atom is gaining an electron, okay? And so with reduction, it's reducing the positive charge. That's the because it's, I know for a lot of you, it's very hard to wrap your brain around um, the fact that if I reduce something, I give it something, it gains something. But what I'm doing is it's reducing the positive charge. Okay, and so by gaining an extra electron that has a negative charge, the positive charge reduces. So that's why that atom has been reduced. When an atom has gone through oxidation, it loses an electron, okay, and so its positive charge actually would increase. 
So let's talk about what an oxidation number is. Because we said over uh, just a second ago that if the, uh, the atom has been oxidized, it loses an electron and the oxidation number increases. Okay, so oxidation numbers, they are, if they're positive, Okay, so if the oxidation number is positive, and just so you know, I'm probably going to start stop writing positive at this point. Okay, so if the oxidation is positive, then that means the total number of the electrons that have been, they have been removed to get it to its current state. So a positive oxidation number is the total number of electrons that have been removed to get it to its current state. We're going to look at examples of the stuff first, too. Let me just kind of get through some of these definitions, and then we'll go from there. Okay. So if the po a positive oxidation is the total number of electrons that have been removed to get it to its current state, because remember, if I have removed electrons, then I'm going to be increasing my positive charge. Okay. And so a negative oxidation number, then, would be my total number of electrons that have been added to get it to its current state. Because remember, if, I, if my oxidation number becomes more negative, okay, I'm adding electrons. I'm making my charge more negative. So a positive oxidation number, the total number of electrons that have been removed to get it to its current state. Negative is my total number of electrons that have been added to get it to current state. So let's take a look at a couple of just kind of rules regarding oxidation numbers that may help you a little bit. So the first one would be that an uncombined element, okay, so an element that's all by itself. It hasn't done anything. It hasn't reacted with anything, okay. So an uncombined element, its oxidation number is always going to be zero, Okay, so an uncombined element, its oxidation number equals zero because it hasn't been altered. Electrons haven't been added to it and they haven't been taken away from it. Okay, uh, these would th be things like O2. It's not combined with carbon, it's not combined with water, so its um, oxidation number would be zero. No, no electrons have been added to it, taken away from it. Okay, uh, let's see, chlorine. Uh, xenon, pretty much anything you could think of okay, that hasn't been, that is an uncombined element. The second thing would be the sum of the, of the oxidation uh, states or numbers in an in, in atom or in a neutral compound has to equal up to zero. So the sum of oxidation numbers in a neutral compound is going to equal zero. Because, again, it's a neutral compound, so it can't have a charge. Let's look at an example with this one. Let's look at water. Okay? Water is a neutral compound. Okay? It is not you know, H2O plus or H2O negative. It's a neutral compound. And so the oxidation number for oxygen is negative 2. Okay? So the oxidation number for oxygen is negative 2. The oxidation number for hydrogen is positive 1. All right, so my oxidation number of oxygen is negative 2. My oxidation number of hydrogen is positive 1. And so in this compound, they need to add up to 0. Well, in this compound, I happen to have two hydrogens. Plus 1, plus 1, minus 2, I get 0. Okay, so my neutral compound, I've had two electrons okay, that have been added to the oxygen, so that makes it a negative two, and I have one electron that's been taken from each hydrogen to get it to its current state. Now, if that oxygen was all by itself and uncombined like it was up here, okay, then it wouldn't have this, um, it would still be zero because it hasn't bonded with hydrogen, it's uncombined. But because it's with hydrogen, that changes its oxidation number. Let's look at this next one, okay? So the more electronegative, you're really going to see my shorthand come through, the more electronegative um, element in a substance, 
So the one that has a stronger affinity for the electrons. Okay, so the more electronegative substance um, is given a negative oxidation state. So the more electronegative element in a substance is given a negative oxidation state. which means my less electronegative element is going to be given a positive oxidation state. Let's look at our water example again. Okay, remember we've got our water. Remember water is polar? All right, so if water is polar, okay, remember the electrons spend a little bit more time around this oxygen. So that means oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen, which is why the oxygen gets that negative oxidative number, and the hydrogen gets a positive oxidation number, okay? because the more electronegative is going to give it a negative oxidation number. The last thing I want to look at with these oxidation numbers is a periodic table. Okay? So if you use a periodic table for this, you can see group 1 has a positive oxidation number of 1, group 2 positive oxidation number of 2. Okay, um, oxygen over here, negative 2. Okay, um, next group here, negative 1. Okay, and then oxidation numbers of 0 because you aren't going to add or remove electrons from them because they are full. They are in a happy state. Okay, so that's another way if you, because um, you don't need to memorize these oxidation numbers. Okay, um, I just think uh, seeing them in examples, especially for a lot of you that are very math oriented, okay, it, it makes a lot more sense when you can say plus two minus two equals zero. Okay, that's how I got a neutral compound. Okay, so if you use this reference for your periodic table, though, if you can picture where things are in the periodic table, that may help you to see who got oxidized and who got reduced. So these oxidation numbers, again, these, these redox reactions, they are important for, for energy transfer reactions, photosynthesis, uh, respiration, because this is how we talk about electron acceptors, when we talk NADPH, okay, that's what we're talking about here, is this movement of these electrons around, so these redox reactions. So they're very important in respiration and in photosynthesis. And not all of these reactions will involve an actual transfer of electrons. Okay? They will involve a transfer of energy, but some of these redox reactions may just have a change in the distribution of the covalent bonds. So let's take a look at those. We're going to uh, look at respiration itself and how that is a redox reaction where we are um, rearrange, basically rearranging these electrons, changing the distribution in the covalent bonds. Okay, so hopefully you guys recognize this as your equation for um, cellular respiration. So let's kind of walk through what's happening here. So let's focus on the carbon first. Okay, so let's talk about what the oxidation number for the carbon is in glucose. Okay, so we're looking for our oxidation number of carbon in the glucose. Okay, and so that oxidation number for carbon in our glucose is going to be zero. Okay, so let's take a second and look at why that would be zero. Okay, so remember, this is a compound, right? And it's a neutral compound. So its total needs to be zero, right? Okay, sorry, I can't handle the mess. So its total needs to be zero. Well, we know that oxygen's oxidation number is negative two. We know that hydrogen's oxidation number is plus 1. Well, if I have 12 hydrogens, I've got a plus 12. And if I've got 6 oxygens, I've got a negative 12. Okay, well, those already equal 0. So carbon's oxidation number in this instance here has to be 0. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a neutral compound. Okay. So then let's look at the oxidation number of... So let's abbreviate this some the oxidation number now of our carbon in CO2. Okay, well, your oxidation number of your carbon in CO2 is going to be a plus 4, right? Because I've got a neutral compound again. Oxygen is negative 2. There are two oxygen atoms in that compound. So oxygen is equal to 
negative 4, which means to equal 0, right, I need to have a positive 4 because this is a neutral compound. So something has changed here. So what does that mean in our redox formation here? Okay, so over here, my oxidation number of carbon is a positive 4. Over here, it's a 0. So what this tells me here is that carbon is oxidized in this reaction. Okay, carbon is oxidized in this reaction which means that it lost electrons, right? It lost electrons because its charge, right, its oxidation number became more positive. Its oxidation number became more positive, so it was oxidized, which means it lost electrons. Remember, if we reduce something, we reduce its positive charge, okay? And that's not what happened. We've increased the positive charge here. So in this reaction of cellular respiration, Okay, carbon is oxidized. So let's do the same thing and follow that through with the oxygen. So what happens to the oxygen here? So our oxidation number uh, our oxidation number of oxygen in the O2 is Come on, hopefully you get it right, okay? It is zero because this is an element. It is uncombined, okay? So it's not combined with anything, so that oxygen is not going to have that negative two oxidation number because it's an element that is not combined and all of our elements are zero. So now let's go hop over to the other side and let's look at our oxidation number of the oxygen in water. Okay, so the oxidation, of, uh, oxidation number of our oxygen in water is going to be negative 2. Because this is a compound, but it needs to equal to equal 0, right? So the oxygen in this case is combined with hydro hydrogen. Well, we know hydrogen is plus 1. I've got two hydrogens there, so I'm at plus 2 now. Okay, I need it to equal 0, right? So I need a negative 2. So now over here in water, my oxidation number of oxygen is negative 2. So what's happening here in, then, my result here is that oxygen, in this case now, as we talk about the oxygen, it is reduced. Okay, so the oxygen has been reduced. Okay, it went from 0 to negative 2. Okay, I've reduced my positive charge. It had electrons added to it. Okay, so that would be an exa another example of, a, of kind of applying a redox reaction here. So we'll do, some, we'll do some more work with redox reactions in class. We're going to you know, continue to apply these uh, through cellular respiration. Um, the glucose, the organic compounds, we use these as we transfer the organic compounds to those NAD uh, pluses and FAD. H2s, um, hopefully you guys remember those a little bit from your freshman year. We talk about electron acceptors, okay? We're talking about oxidizing agents. Let's, let's take a look for those for just a second. So y'all may remember from your freshman year, hopefully, okay? One of the, we had NAD plus, and that became NADH. Remember we talked about that your freshman year, how it was a electron carrier. We called it the shuttle bus. You know, it would pick the electrons up and it would take them to the electron transport chain. Okay, um, well, let's talk a little bit more about what that means in redox terms, okay? So NAD plus here is an electron acceptor. So what does that mean for it, um, oxidation reduction-wise? Okay, so it gets reduced because it gets electrons added to it. You see NADH doesn't have a charge, doesn't have that positive charge to it. So it gets reduced. It gets electrons added to it. It's electron ex um, acceptor. It's co what's called an oxidizing agent, meaning that while it gets reduced, while it gets electrons added to it, it was taking electrons from somewhere else. It was oxidizing whatever um, molecule it basically took those electrons from. Okay? And this is going to happen during cellular respiration. And the benefit to these is as we... <coughs> As we move these electrons around, it allows us to store energy and synthesize ATP. 
And so when it forms this NADH, when it accepts those electrons, okay, that represents stored energy. And we take that stored energy and we convert it into ATP. So let's briefly overview cellular respiration. Remember, we've got two kinds, right? We've got aerobic. That's an I. This is terrible. We have aerobic and anaerobic or fermentation respiration, right? Remember, they all start with glycolysis. And then depending upon whether oxygen is present or not, okay, we go into either Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, or we continue the fermentation route, depending upon if oxygen is present. So our focus at first is going to be over here on if oxygen is present, and then we'll come back and apply this fermentation to it. Okay, so uh, glycolysis is going to be the beginning step of any kind of respiration, whether it's aerobic or anaerobic. Um, and so if you remember, lysis means to break apart. Okay, and in this case, we're breaking apart glucose, uh, which could be in the form of glycogen. Okay, so we're breaking that apart into smaller pieces. So really what we're doing here with our overview here of, of glycolysis is we're going to take this glucose molecule, okay, and we're going to end up breaking it into, remember it's a six-carbon molecule, we're going to end up breaking that into two pyruvates. Oh, I ran out of room. Okay, we're going to break that into two pyruvates, which are three carbon molecules. And in the process of breaking that glucose, uh, rearranging those glucose molecules into um, the pyruvate molecules, we're going to uh, release some ATP. Okay, we're also going to uh, release some NADH from this. Okay, it's going to release some NADH. And this process also requires an input of ATP. So it's not a spontaneous reaction. Okay? It is an endergonic reaction. It requires an input of energy for it to start. Okay? So it requires some energy going in, and it will also release some energy, though. Okay? So glycolysis is going to occur in the cytoplasm. So it occurs in the cytoplasm of both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Okay, so if you remember prokaryotic versus a eukaryotic cell, prokaryotic cells have no membrane-bound organelles, while eukaryotic cells do have membrane-bound organelles. Okay, so, oh, that's not very helpful. Okay, so let's just look at these for just a quick second here. You've got your eukaryotic cell on the left and your prokaryotic cell on the right. Let me see if I can get rid of some of There we go. Okay, and so your eukaryotic cell has all those membrane-bound organelles. Your prokaryotic cell does not. However, though, they both have cytoplasm. Okay, so this doesn't require any special machinery or anything to happen. Okay, so glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm. So you don't need a mitochondria to be able to do glycolysis. So glycolysis has what's called an energy investment phase. And that's the part where it requires that input of ATP for it to actually happen. Okay, so this energy investment phase requires an input of two ATPs. Okay, so two ATPs are required to go into the reaction to make it happen, okay, to make it start. And when those two ATPs are put in there, that's going to begin to split the glucose. Okay, we're going to take this glucose and we're going to split it into fructose, and we're going to take that glucose and we're going to split it into fructose, technically diphosphate. Because okay? we've added to, we phosphorylated the molecule and we split it and phosphorylated. When you guys are looking in your book, you're going to see pictures of glycolysis and it's going to list a ton of steps and a whole bunch of enzymes and you do not have to memorize those. Okay? You do not have to memorize that. Okay? So you just really need to know what I'm telling you. Okay, so we take the glucose, rearrange it into the fructose diphosphate by uh, phosphorylating it with these ATPs, okay, and then that fructose diphosphate is going to be split into, remember these P-gal molecules? Okay, and if you remember, these are three carbon molecules, right? I've got six carbons, six carbons, and then I'm splitting them into these three carbon molecules, these P-gals. This is what we have happening so far in picture form. Okay, if you kind of get yourself oriented a little bit. So this is obviously going to be my cytoplasm. 
And this is an example of a eukaryotic cell that has a mitochondria. But remember, this can still happen in prokaryotic cells. Glycolysis is thought to be one of the oldest metabolic pathways. It's been around for a long time. Okay, um, so that's why you see it in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So in this energy investment phase, I've got my glucose molecule. Okay, here come my ATPs. Okay, my ATPs, you can see how they've phosphorylated okay, and split that glucose molecule. So now I've got my two three carbon molecules here. So that's my first step, and that's part of my energy investment here. Okay, is I've taken those two ATPs, phosphorylated the glucose, split it in half. My next step then is part of my energy harvesting phase. So this is where I'm actually going to get some energy payoff here that I'll be able to utilize. So that PGAL, those PGAL molecules, remember you have two of them, okay, they are going to be converted into the pyruvate. And remember pyruvate is a three carbon molecule and the PGAL is a three carbon molecule. So really I'm just kind of rearranging stuff here. Okay, so in this energy harvesting phase, as we do this conversion, okay, we've got ATP that are released, two of them in particular. That's a big mess. Can't do the mess. Okay, so we've got ATP that are being released. Um, technically, you get a, you've got two ATP being released from this one PGAL molecule. So you need to keep in mind you've got two of these PGAL molecules being converted into pyruvate. So really you'd have four ATP. Okay, so I've got um, two ATP being released, and I get one of those NAD plus electron acceptors converted to an NADH. Okay, so in that oxidation reduction situation here, okay, my NAD plus got reduced. I reduced my positive charge on my NAD plus. It is an electron acceptor. Okay, so I get two of these NADH per glucose as well as four ATP. Because remember, this is happening two times because there are two PGAL molecules. So in total now, a per glucose molecule, I got four ATPs and two NADHs when I converted that glucose into the two pyruvate molecules. Okay, but you gotta remember we put an ATP, we put a couple of ATP in. So I really end up with a net gain, okay, because I put in two, I made four, and I put in two. So I have a net gain of those two. Okay, I've got two, essentially, um, I made two more than I invested. Okay, so I have a net gain of two ATP. That NAD plus has picked up electrons as well as hydrogen atoms from the carbon. Okay, so it's picked up electrons as well as hydrogen atoms from the carbon. So the NADH, okay, the NAD plus, it got reduced to the NADH, which means the carbon had to have been oxidized. Okay, it's been oxidized, it lost electrons, and so its positive charge increased. So the ATP that's produced during glycolysis is produced by substrate level phosphorylation. There's no way that's going to fit there. Okay, and that's going to require enzymes. Okay, and here, so here's your enzyme here. Okay, my substrate is ADP. Okay, this is my inorganic phosphate. Okay, now I end up with a TP. So substrate level phosphorylation is how my ATP is produced during glycolysis. Now that we've so now that we've made this pyruvate, so the whole process here, okay, and let's sum up our process here. Well, actually, let's sum up our process using um, some energy conversion. Okay, so let's look at let's look at that. So, kind of summing up here, then what happens with glycolysis is I've got my glucose coming in. Okay, remember it's an endergonic reaction, so it requires an input of energy. So there's two ATP that are used in my energy investment, and then I start harnessing some energy. I have form eight, four ATP. So then I get that net gain of two ATP. Okay, I reduce two of those NAD pluses. 
because again I'm going to end up making two pyruvate molecules. So I end up with two electron acceptors that can still do, they still contain energy, they've harnessed that energy. Remember they, they represent stored energy, so they can still go release some more energy. I've got two ATP, it's not very many, I'd like some more. Okay, And I've got a couple of pyruvate. And so now we need to determine the fate of those pyruvate, and that will determine that will be determined um, based on the presence of oxygen. And so if oxygen is present, that pyruvate will go through oxidation. Okay, so that pyruvate will go through oxidation and become what's called acetyl CoA. And acetyl CoA is what is able to go into the mitochondria. And uh, the acetyl-CoA is what's able to enter the Krebs cycle. So the pyruvate goes into the mitochondria, gets converted to acetyl-CoA, and can then start the Krebs cycle. Okay, so let's walk through what happens um, when this pyruvic acid gets turned into acetyl-CoA. So first of all, like I said, the pyruvate is going to enter the mitochondria. And again, this only happens if oxygen is present. If there is no oxygen present, none of this happens. Okay, it doesn't go into the mitochondria, so it doesn't form acetyl-CoA. Okay, after it enters the mitochondria, one carbon will be removed. Remember, it was a three-carbon molecule that entered. Okay, now I've got my two-carbon molecule, and I've got a carbon dioxide. And so that carbon dioxide is a waste product. Remember, one of the products of cellular respiration is CO2. This is where the CO2 is formed. So that carbon is stripped off of the pyruvate molecule, and it's released as a waste product um, as CO2. Now I've got electrons that are able to be stripped from the two carbon fragment that I have here. So here's my NADH, my electron carrier. Okay? It's going to strip reactions, or it's going to strip electrons from there. Okay? So it's really not in a, um, NADH until it's stripped the electrons. So my electron carrier gets reduced, and again my carbons are getting oxidized. Okay, because they are losing electrons, so their positive charge is increasing. Okay, and so now, so I've gone like this, okay, and so now I have what's called coenzyme A. Coenzyme A can now come attach, a, um, can now come attach to my little two carbon fragment, and I get acetyl CoA, which is the whole big molecule here. And acetyl-CoA then is what can go into the Krebs cycle and finish the, um, can finish the oxidative uh, phosphorylation or the um, aerobic respiration. Okay, so we're going to stop here with this and we'll do some work with this in class and then we'll move on and do the rest of oxidative respiration on the next video.